at the present time, we are assessing that problem and should have a resolution shortly. But we are holding at the present time at T minus nine minutes. This is shuttle launch control. It seemed like the whole country was waiting as a 30 minute hold stretched into a 48 hour delay. NASA engineers worked feverishly to fix a bulky computer. Twice, astronauts John Young and Bob Crippen headed for the launch pad. They would not be disappointed the second time. Space Shuttle Columbia was ready for its maiden flight. Six, five, four, we've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Pilot astronaut Bob Crippen especially liked one aspect of the mission. The most delightful things associated with a flight uh, from a standpoint of being a rookie doing it was experiencing zero G for the first time for extended duration. Uh, that's uh, such a delightful environment that uh, it's almost impossible to tell anybody about it and it's nothing you can really liken it to here on Earth. I guess the most similar thing is swimming but you don't have the effects of water holding you back. Uh, it's really a neat thing. And the other aspect is getting to, to look out at Earth from those kind of altitudes. It's, uh, it's a beautiful place. As the second and final day of the flight approached, thousands of people settled down for the night along the dry desert lake bed at NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center where Columbia would land. They too were not disappointed. At 10.20 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, Astronaut John Young nosed Columbia toward runway 23. The ever-stoic John Young could not hide the joy he felt at Columbia's success as he bounded down the steps to inspect his ship and kick the tires. He and Bob Crippen had spent hundreds of hours in simulators preparing for the moments just past, and the entire nation shared those moments with them. Even the monumental traffic jam that followed the landing did little to dampen people's spirits. It's really incredible, really fantastic, beautiful. Well worth the traffic jam. <laughs> really, if you had to sit out here all day long, it'd be worth it. I didn't know it was to be that exciting. We it, caught, it, caught it right here and it just floated in. And then you could see the two chase planes right behind it and it just came on down. It's unbelievable. Questa cosa è stata meravigliosa, proprio stupenda. Sono molto contento di essere venuto oggi. That's it. Twelve days after landing, Columbia was mounted atop its now familiar 747 carrier aircraft and returned to the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. There in the orbiter processing facility, technicians prepared Columbia for its next flight. That pair of solid rocket boosters that helped hurl the space shuttle into orbit parachuted safely back to an ocean landing. One of them is shown here being towed back to port to be cleaned and reused on a later shuttle mission. 
Recently, Columbia was moved to the Vehicle Assembly Building, where it was mated with its solid rocket motors and fuel tank, the last step before rolling out to the launch pad. And at 4.45 a.m., Monday, August 31st, Columbia did just that, lumbering slowly to the pad, mounted on the same crawler transporter that used to carry the huge Saturn V moon rockets. The commander for Columbia's second orbital test flight is 49-year-old astronaut Joe Engel. A native of Abilene, Kansas, Engel has a long career as a test pilot and technically earned his first astronaut wings while flying the rocket-powered X-15 along the fringes of space. Engel really likes to fly most anything, including World War II fighter aircraft. He also spends time with son John as they work together on their vintage Army observation plane. We asked Engel what the upcoming space shuttle flight meant to him personally. It's certainly a, a tremendous uh, responsibility, but it's a tremendous opportunity as well. It, it's, a, it's an opportunity to, uh, to put to use um, uh, a long... Uh, a long background of flight test experience and flight test getting ready to, to, uh, to do what I consider to be just about the ultimate in flight testing on this mission. A chance to really pay back to all the, all the people who put the effort into to giving the opportunities for Dick and I to go fly the flight. Joe Engel is no stranger to shuttle landings. Twice in 1977, he and Dick Truly glided the Enterprise to near perfect touchdowns. And during that series of flights, we were able to gain experience on um, the systems, maturity on the systems, uh, the hydraulic and communications and electrical systems on the airplane. And we also had a chance to get an early look at the handling qualities of the shuttle. And uh, we're able to make some minor adjustments to the flight control system in the landing phase of the program. So uh, we gained, uh, gained experience, operational experience in knowing how to handle and how to fly and what some of the limitations of the airplane were. And we also gained a lot as far as the uh, system's maturity on the space shuttle. Just as he did during the approach and landing tests, astronaut Richard Truly, 43, from Fayette, Mississippi, will serve as pilot for the second flight of Columbia sharing the workload with Joe Engel. Flight will be about twice as long as STS-1. It'll be uh, just over five days uh, in length. And the on-orbit activities will be essentially uh, to do a series of flight test uh, uh, objectives that are required to declare the Spaceship Columbia operational after a few of these initial uh, orbital flight tests. While there are no plans for the crew to go outside the shuttle orbiter, extravehicular activity procedures, or EVAs as they are called, are practiced underwater at the Johnson Space Center. Dick truly explains. The underwater uh, work is, uh, n is necessary to train for the uh, EVA, the contingency EVA that we might have to do. Uh, and we have to do the underwater work because the only other way to simulate zero gravity on Earth is in a in a, our KC-135 Zero-G airplane, and in, in that airplane, uh, the exposure to zero gravity is only 30 to 40 seconds at a time. Underwater, even though it's not a perfect simulation of zero gravity, uh, you, can, you can stay down uh, for hours at a time and thereby get a tremendous amount of uh, work done. Columbia will be launched with more than just a two-man crew aboard. For the first time, the shuttle will carry a working payload into space. The cargo is OSTA-1, a series of experiments developed by NASA's Office of Space and Terrestrial Applications and mounted on a special aluminum platform supplied by the European Space Agency. These are Earth Resources experiments designed to exploit the shuttle's vantage point in space. New techniques of observing Earth's surface and atmosphere should give scientists better ways to survey food supplies water sources, oil and mineral deposits, and thunderstorm activity. Obviously, the, the purpose of the shuttle is to provide a cheaper, more, more economical, and easier system to take payloads up and down. And uh, just to, as an indication of, uh, of the fact that we think that we have built the right spacecraft for the right time, 
uh, our payload bay is booked up for the next several years on uh, payloads that are already paid for and in production and uh, and we could uh, if we had more orbiters today we I'm sure that the payloads would uh, fill up the payload bay just about as fast as we could turn the vehicle around a 50-foot long Canadian built mechanical arm called the remote manipulator system or RMS for short has been installed along the side of the Space Shuttle Columbia's payload bay. It was built by Spar Aerospace Limited of Toronto under contract to the National Research Council of Canada. Simulations to train the crew and check out the 994 pound arm have been a real challenge according to Johnson Space Center's manager of payload deployment and retrieval systems Clay McCullough. The arm cannot lift itself uh, here on Earth. Uh, that seems strange, but in orbit, it can handle a 65,000-pound payload, of course, because it's weightless, but it does have mass. It has to be considered. But here on Earth, we cannot run a, a test and have the arm uh, move around and, and look at how it operates. Uh, so simulations have been very important to us. We have simulations up in the Toronto facility at Spire Aerospace Limited. Those are electronically scene-generated, and, and uh, they have all of the detailed uh, uh, characteristics of the arm. We have an arm here at JSC which is not flight-like. It's a big heavy arm that's hydraulic, hydraulically uh, operated rather than electrically and it is used primarily for the crew to understand the relationship of how the payloads are in the bay and the arm to the to the payloads. At NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center engineers have been putting the arm through its paces underwater where they can also come close to the weightless conditions that exist in space. The remote manipulator system eventually will be used to remove payloads and place them in orbit. It can also retrieve satellites that have malfunctioned, repair them on the spot, or return them to Earth. Astronaut Sally Ride, who has been working closely with the designers and builders of the remote manipulator system, will be the CAPCOM, or capsule communicator, when the crew begins operating the arm in space. Again, Clay McCullough. We have a lot of new ideas, technology. The control system is extremely complex. And uh, to have someone capable like Sally that knows it in great detail and talk to the crewman that will actually be operating it will be a, a great uh, advantage to, to the control center. Columbia Houston, uh, that should be no problem. That, uh, Ever wonder how those flight controllers stay so calm? To find out, we talked to the lead flight director for the upcoming space shuttle mission, Charles Lewis. Primarily two ways. Uh, we, the controllers, participate in the development of the flight data file, which is a set of operational documents the crew carries on board. And the other way is that we do integrated simulations uh, with the crew the shuttle mission simulator is interfaced to the control center and we run a simulation, a portion of the flight and the telemetry data is brought in from the simulator, tracking data and so forth. It looks just like the real flight as far as uh, sitting at the control center consoles. The simulation team, our training people, then insert faults or systems malfunctions that uh, the crew and the control center must react to. Uh, it identifies uh, uh, perhaps uh, areas that we've not talked about or discussed and we go back and work those. And we repeat those integrated sims uh, several times, and as we do that, we refine our documentation and we home in on all of the, most of the quad if this happens to us questions and develop procedures to cope with them. Uh, Roger, we copied, Joe. Uh, we're putting together a teleprinter message for you that should summarize... What when Columbia is launched and returned this time, it will mark the beginning of a new era in reusable space transportation. The astronauts, flight controllers, launch team, and the hundreds of people behind the scenes are working toward that goal. Columbia Houston, uh, that should be no problem. That, uh, Flight two of the space shuttle is point. nearly ready. Over. This special report brought to you by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.